Immersed in Ireland's timeless beauty is a dark history of magic, ritual and primeval worship. Elemental forces from this ancient past come back as apparitions to wander amongst the living. And many of these restless souls are trapped in Ireland's castles. The spirits reach out from the beyond, lost phantoms that have become the castle ghosts of Ireland. If you don't believe in ghosts, a visit to Ireland might change your mind. The Emerald Isle is filled with eerie occurrences and unexplained phenomena which might make even the most sceptical among you pause for thought. But a word of warning. What you will see could disturb you. Ireland is a land so rich in history and mythology. It is difficult to know where one begins and the other ends. Among the sacred spots, burial mounds and bewitched trees of Ireland. The spirit other world of the dead is as real as that of the living. Ireland is crowded with supernatural inhabitants, creatures like fairies. But here, fairies are not cartoon-like creatures with wings and magic wands. According to folklore, they can assume human characteristics and live side by side with mortals. If disturbed, fairies can be sinister and dangerous, exacting vicious revenge on humans. It is very bad luck to build on ground belonging to the fairies. Across Ireland, places known as fairy forts are left untouched by humans. These fairy dwellings often take the form of a ring of trees or a circle of stones. To build upon the forbidden sites would anger the fairies and result in misfortune and even death. Myth has it that angered fairies shoot poisoned darts at cattle and horses. They can transport men and women away from their loved ones into a dark fairy land. And most disturbing of all, they carry off human children substituting changelings in their place. In Ireland, spirits and ghosts slip in and out of the living world, some to do good, others to do harm. And it is in Ireland's haunted castles that many of these ancient souls still dwell. In County Carlow on Ireland's east coast, in the village of Clonegall, stands Huntington Castle. This historic castle is the home of disturbing apparitions from another world and another time. The castle was originally built in the 14th century as the stronghold of the Cavanas, an old Irish clan. Since that time, there have been many changes of ownership and the castle has been rebuilt and added to by each successive owner. 
At one time an abbey stood here. Religion has always had a special place at Huntington. But something even older dwells at Huntington. A primeval psychic force from Ireland's deepest history. So powerful it radiates beyond the castle walls. In this field, a man who knows Huntington well has been a witness to unusual sightings. He says that he's repeatedly seen a group of men and women in the field in long clothes, that they've been moving away across the field and that they've suddenly vanished. And here in an area of wilderness called the Yew Walk, many people have seen unexplained figures moving among the trees. But it is this spot, deep inside Huntington, that may well be the centre of the castle's hauntings. This ancient wellspring, 15 foot deep or so, is believed to be a sacred site and to possess magic power. It has never run dry and it has provided the castle with a lifeline of water in times of siege. Huntington Castle has been owned by the Durden Robertson family since the 18th century. The current owner is David Durden Robertson. You live among the legends and the stories here, David. Have you experienced anything really strange yourself? I have several, but the most um, odd experience I had was when I was about 17. I'd gone to sleep on the couch in the library. When I woke up, the room was quite bright and the whole couch was almost sort of spinning around. I became aware at that stage that there were two faces peering down at me. His body was lifted up until he was actually floating above the couch. Well, it was the most extraordinary experience. They hadn't touched me, but they just looked down at me. It was as if I was in their power. David felt that time had stopped. As in a waking dream, he was able to observe his own body, but not control it. He was having what is known as an out-of-body experience. These Vivid encounters with the apparitions which he describes attest to their existence. But the question remains, who are they and what do they want? And the answer may lie deep in the cruel past of Ireland's history. The native inhabitants of Ireland were the Celts. And 1,500 years ago, a special priestly class of learned men lived among them. These people professed to have magic powers and a secret knowledge of the world. They were the Druids. As the keepers of religion, Druid leaders often rivaled Celtic kings and chiefs in prestige even in power. The Druids have a special place in Irish mythology. For apart from their great learning, their extraordinary powers enabled them to act as intermediaries between gods and mortals. They were believed to be able, at a stroke, to create a mist, start fires at will or bring down showers of blood. 
The Druids were held in awe for their wisdom, but they were also feared. Animals were regularly used in sacrifices, but to commune with the gods, Druids needed the most valuable and potent blood offering of all. Human sacrifice. The Druids picked fine young men and women who were ritually sacrificed as mates for the gods. There were many methods of sacrifice. The chosen victims were burned in huge wicker structures, impaled on stakes, drowned, or buried alive. Because of their reverence for the natural world, a favorite form of sacrifice was to slit the victims' throats and let their blood flow into the earth. Is it possible the figures David saw looming over him were the ghosts of ancient druids? Had they returned in search of a victim? Huntington Castle is in some way connected with these spirits of an earlier, darker time. Indeed, this mysterious, sacred well in the core of the castle is called the Druid Well. It remains the castle's spiritual centre and may be the source of Druid visits into our modern world. The bloody events of over 1,500 years ago are still imprinted here, centres of energy, held in the atmosphere of Huntington's ancient walls. And perhaps the Druids will return here again from the beyond, hunting for victims to sacrifice to their pagan gods. Some ghosts are a mystery that can never be solved. Why do they appear in certain places and at certain times? But other ghosts have a special attachment to a particular place and return to it again and again. This is the case at our next castle, where a ghost came back from the world of the dead to help its living descendants. The ghost appeared quite recently at Castle Leslie, which lies in County Monaghan, near the border between Southern and Northern Ireland. The castle has been the home of the Leslie family for over 300 years. In January 1996, Castle Leslie was invaded by paranormal activity and a series of identical sightings of an unexpected guest. Perhaps the mistress of Castle Leslie can throw some light on the enigma. Samantha runs the castle and is a direct descendant of Bishop John Leslie who bought the estate in 1664. Sammy, You've had direct experience of this particular Castle Leslie ghost? Yes, on a number of occasions the uh, bells in the servants' hall would start ringing and I knew there was nobody else in the house. Another time I was in the hall behind the kitchen and I was looking for something in the deep freeze and I saw a grey figure walk past behind me. Sammy assumed it was Alton, her partner, and called out to him. He didn't answer. Alton! She then realised that it couldn't have been Alton. He was out of the castle at the time. And then, over the next few months, supernatural activity fairly erupted at Leslie. Sammy was alone, cooking in the castle kitchen, when from behind her she heard a strange noise. A shower of orange pits hit the wall beside her, and there was no one else in the room. That was frightening enough, but then another thing happened. 
Again, Sammy was working in the kitchen when quite suddenly the electric food mixer burst into life. And it wasn't even plugged in. What Sammy experienced was poltergeist activity and its strange energy seemed to fill the house. But unlike most poltergeists, this spirit soon made its identity known. Three separate sets of guests at the castle described a ghostly ordeal in the bedroom known as the Red Room. None of the guests had stayed at Leslie before and had no knowledge of the castle's history, but they all recounted almost identical experiences. The first guest couple reported being woken in the middle of the night by a light in the room. They described a soft daylight. Then through the light they saw a man standing over the chest of drawers. It appeared he was looking for something. Then the image and the light faded away. A few weeks later, another couple stayed at the castle. They slept here in the red bedroom. The next morning they described exactly the same thing as the previous couple. The strange light and the man in that corner of the room. But this time the guests experienced something more frightening. The figure moved over to the end of their bed. Facing the couple, he put his finger to his lips and softly whispered, shh, then disappeared. Just a few weeks after the second sighting, the man in the pale light returned to Castle Leslie for a third time. Once again, two guests staying in the red bedroom were woken by the strange light. Terrified, they saw the figure in the corner of the room by the chest. But this time the man walked to the bed, held up a scroll of papers and smiled. Transfixed by the apparition, the couple saw that across his forehead was a bloody wound. Who was this ghost and why did he keep appearing at the castle? A reason may be found in Ireland's recent history. At the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Ireland's soldiers and reservists were immediately mobilised. By the end of the war, more than 200,000 Irishmen had served not only Ireland, but Great Britain. And many had given their lives. In 1914, Sammy's great uncle, Norman Leslie, was in his mid-twenties. Like so many men at the time, he volunteered to fight in the Great War. Norman was the son of Lady Leonie Leslie. Leonie and Norman were devoted to each other, so it was with great reluctance but a sense of duty that she saw her son leave the castle to fight with the Rifle Brigade in France. Weeks passed. The exact whereabouts of his regiment were secret, but Leonie wrote her son many letters, sending him news of home and looking forward to his safe return. Then on the morning of October the 18th, 1914, word came up to the castle. Young Master Norman had been seen standing on the far side of the lake. The gamekeeper who saw him ran to the castle to bring Lady Leonie the good news. Another estate worker sent word that he too had spotted Norman in the grounds. Overjoyed, Leonie flew into action. Norman's room was hurriedly prepared and the servants made the castle ready to welcome the soldier home.
But an hour passed, and then another, and still Norman did not come. He never came. A week later, a telegram arrived. Norman had been killed in action at Almontière, France. The date of his death was the 18th of October 1914, the very day he'd been seen standing by the castle lake. The exact whereabouts of Norman's body was unknown, but his family was determined to find it and give him a proper burial. Two months later, Norman's brother Shane travelled to the French battlefield where Norman had been killed. Shane was guided to the spot near a railway embankment where a fellow soldier had written that Norman's body had been left, buried in a shallow grave, wrapped in sacking. Shane looked down on the body of what he thought was his brother. To make sure that it was Norman, he put his hand inside the gaping jaw and felt for the broken tooth that would identify the young soldier. The remains were indeed Norman's. The painful task was completed when Norman's body was buried at a church nearby. The appearance of Norman by the lake is a form of apparition seen at times of crisis such as war when thousands can die in a single day. It is one of the most widely reported types of ghost. It is as if at the very moment of crisis or death, while the spirit is not yet released from earthly bonds, a telepathic connection creates a spontaneous image of the individual. This ghostly image can appear before a loved one or in a place to which in life they were especially attached. I think Norman's spirit feels a very strong bond with his home and a very deep love for his family. And I think it was very important when he died that he came back to say his goodbyes. But that isn't quite the end of the story, is it? Norman's been back again, hasn't he? He has. Sammy believes it was Norman in the servants' hall trying to attract her attention with the bells. And in the kitchen, throwing the orange pits and starting the appliance. Of course, the red room was Norman's bedroom. Who else could the ghost have been? And the papers Norman's ghost held up? Sammy felt that the apparitions and poltergeist occurrences were Norman's way of trying to get a message to her. The papers were the clue. For many years, the Leslie family had been in conflict over the inheritance of the estate. Sammy had searched for an important document which she hoped would solve their problems. But her efforts to find it had proved fruitless and eventually she gave up. After Norman's ghost was sighted holding the scroll of papers, Sammy was prompted to search for the documents again in the castle vaults. When she touched a certain file, a shudder went up her spine. It contained the very papers the family needed. If Norman's ghost had not appeared, the file would have remained undiscovered and Sammy's claim to Castle Leslie would have been in jeopardy. Her future at the castle is now secure because of Norman's appearance. Sammy, do you expect or look for any more visits from Norman? I very much hope he comes back to visit. His room will always be ready and he's always very welcome.
Ghosts manifest themselves in many different ways. Some are figures as solid as a living person. Others bear little resemblance to the human form. Poltergeist hauntings, such as those at Castle Leslie, can be the most disturbing ghost experience. Inanimate objects suddenly erupt in violent motion to disrupt the peaceful routine of the living. Just such a terrifying poltergeist appeared in County Limerick on Ireland's west coast and took hold of Glynn Castle. Situated on the banks of the River Shannon, Glynn Castle dates from the 14th century and is home to the Knight of Glynn. The present castle is a Georgian Gothic fantasy built by the 24th Knight in 1789. Today, the castle remains in the Fitzgerald family and is a delightful home. But it was here on a night in 1991 that two of the castle's loyal workers were subjected to a traumatic ordeal. Sisters Nancy and May had worked at the castle as cook and housekeeper respectively for over 40 years. Leading calm and orderly lives, they had never had a paranormal experience. Until that night. Things started off normally. The night had had a guest for dinner, and May and Nancy cleared away as usual. It was close to midnight by the time they went up to bed. May went straight to sleep, and Nancy read for a while before turning off the light. I was only just settled down about 12 o'clock when I heard this noise on the stairs, as if somebody was coming up, labouring in terrible trouble, like as if they were trying to do the stairs and not able. Nancy called out to another employee of the castle, Una, who slept in the next bedroom. Una! Una! Una called back that she was in bed and had also heard the banging. Nancy finally crossed the landing in the dark and put her hand to the light switch. As soon as she pressed it, everything went quiet. This is the staircase where the noise was coming from. That's the staircase, right up here. And the room, which... Right in there. That's the room that's where the you were sleeping. That's where we were sleeping. That's I would never again in my whole life want the same experience. It was terrible. It was desperate. May and Nancy had spent their working lives in the castle, but they had no idea who or what the poltergeist was. Perhaps... Another haunting at the castle holds the explanation. Here that around the castle really come into their own in the spring months. Magnificent array of daffodils and camellias and also the magnificent shrubs. Sometime later, the Knight of Glynn himself discovered a clue. He learnt that earlier on the day that the poltergeist struck, a group of visitors had been touring the castle. Amongst the visitors had been a psychic medium. Although the medium entered the castle purely as a visitor, could her presence have unwittingly unlocked the violent energy of this most unhappy ghost? The 
The master of the castle is Desmond Fitzgerald, the Knight of Glynn. The Nancy and May story is quite extraordinary, I think. Now, this is an unfair question. Would you describe Nancy and May at all as suggestible ladies? I can assure you that they did not make that up. It was plain in their faces. They were absolutely terrified. Mm -hmm. She lay down in the bed. The answer to Glyn Castle's poltergeist activity may lie in a ghostly experience the knight had as a child. A frayed rope hung in midair. The eerie sight filled the young boy with dread. But when he returned to the hall to show the mysterious rope to his mother, it had disappeared. Perhaps the events of nearly a hundred years before had some bearing on the strange rope apparition the young knight beheld. In 1867, the castle was undergoing decoration. A Dublin firm was employed to carry out the work, which included painting the ceiling under the hall staircase. The builders used planks of wood and heavy rope to form a scaffold. A tragedy struck. Without warning, one of the ropes supporting the planks of wood gave way. The builder painting the ceiling was unable to save himself. He died. Was the rope that the young knight saw all those years later the one that had broken and caused the accident? Perhaps the trauma of that long ago event was still locked into the castle's atmosphere and it took the sensitivity of a young boy momentarily to connect with the anguish of the long forgotten tragedy. It was a long time ago but um, I can picture that rope hanging there really as if it was yesterday. Could the haunting that May and Nancy experienced so recently also be connected with that tragic event? Ghosts of inanimate objects like Glynn's rope are not unique. The strength and intensity of the image may in part be due to the degree of psychic receptiveness of the person present, who seems momentarily to release the ghostly energy. For many Irish families, the approach of death is thought to be foretold by the cry of an other-world woman, the Banshee. The Banshee's wailing has the tone of a real woman's voice, and her cry is heard near the home of those about to die. If this cry is heard three nights in a row, that person will certainly die. The Banshee is more often heard than seen, although some people claim to have glimpsed an old woman who combs her long white hair as she laments. In whatever form ghosts manifest themselves, none is more terrifying than what is called the elemental. This type of spirit is said to exist near Burr in County Offaly, 
where it inhabits Lep Castle. The Elemental is a frightening phantasm from the beyond that envelops those who experience it in its malignant force. The ghost is so horrifying, its hauntings bring an overwhelming sense of evil and deep-rooted fear. And in one remarkable recorded instance, a witness had an intimate experience with this horrifying apparition. She felt the touch of the appalling thing, known at Lep as It. Built in the 14th century, Lep is said to be the most haunted castle in Ireland. As if the very stones were rejecting human habitation, the castle lay in ruins for years. Tall and lonely, the fortress had a ghostly reputation so strong that local people avoided it at night. Completely gutted by fire, Lep was boarded up, its gates padlocked for over 70 years. But from across the fields, late at night, locals would describe seeing the windows at the top of the castle light up for a few seconds as if many candles had been brought into the room. When the elemental haunts the castle, the temperature suddenly falls. There is a suffocating, sickly sweet odour and an overwhelming sense of dread. The vile elemental it seems to have been born out of a long and turbulent history of Lep. And this room has been a witness to its ruthless past. It is known as the Bloody Chapel, after a shocking murder that was done on this very spot over 400 years ago. Lep was then a stronghold of the original owners, the powerful O'Carroll family. They were Irish princes, chieftains of the area. Lep was an impregnable fortress, impervious to ferocious attack. But within the O'Carroll family itself, murderous treachery arose. On the death of the chieftain Mulrooney O'Carroll, in 1532, a fierce rivalry for the leadership erupted among the family. Brother opposed brother in a bitter contest for power. One brother was a priest, his opponent another brother named Tig. One night in the castle chapel, the O'Carroll priest was saying mass for a group of his family. As he was chanting the holy rites, the door of the chapel opened and his rival brother Tig burst in. Tig lunged forward with his sword, fatally wounding his brother. The butchered priest fell across the altar and died. The heinous act of brother killing brother and the blasphemy of a sacred mass cut short by evil sent an echo of misery ringing round the walls of Lep Castle. The sacrilegious murder of the O'Carroll priest may be one cause of the castle's haunting, but another source of evil was found here at Lep, an evil so foul that it may well have compounded and nurtured the curse of the elemental spirit, it. The ghastly secret was discovered here. It is called an oubliette, a name used to describe a hidden dungeon. It means a little place of forgetting. And those who were forgotten within these walls suffered unimaginable misery and pain until death. Lep's oubliette is a little room with a drop floor off the bloody chapel. Prisoners from clan wars or family enemies would be pushed into the room to fall through the floor 
and land on a spike eight feet below. Prisoners not lucky enough to die quickly on the spike faced gradual starvation in a doorless room while the sound of merriment and the aroma of food drifted up from the rooms below. A narrow window let the prisoners watch those who came and went in freedom at the castle. At the turn of the last century, workers were given the task of clearing the oubliette. They made a hideous discovery. Human skeletons lay piled on top of each other. Three cartloads of bones were removed. Another chilling thought. Among the bones, the workmen found this pocket watch, manufactured in the 1840s. Was the dungeon still in use then? It was shortly after the gruesome discovery within Lep's oubliette that a psychic disturbance caused the elemental it to emerge. In 1659, the ownership of Lepp Castle passed in marriage from the O'Carroll family to an English family, the Darbys. In the possession of the Darbys, Lepp became a family home. It was improved and extended, the gardens landscaped, and a full staff employed to maintain it. By the late 19th century, descendants Jonathan and Mildred Darby looked forward to bringing their family up at Lepp. As was the fashion of the day, Mildred Darby was interested in the occult. Little did she know that her innocent dabbling would bring her face to face with it. Because of its bloody associations, Leopard always had a reputation for being haunted. Shall we begin? Nevertheless, Mildred naively toyed with magic. As if sensing a call from the daylight world, the dormant elemental awakened with ferocity. In 1908, Mildred wrote an article for the journal The Occult Review, describing her ordeal at the hands of the terrifying manifestation that infested Lepp. I was standing in the gallery, looking down to the main hall, when I felt somebody put a hand on my shoulder. The thing was about the size of a sheep. Thin, gaunt and shadowy in parts. It, its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman in its vileness. Its lustreless eyes, which seemed half decomposed in black cavities, stared into mine. The horrible smell, which had before offended my nostrils only a hundred times more intensified, came up into my face, filling me with a deadly nausea. It was the smell of a decomposing corpse. The elemental it is thought to be a primitive ghost. It is a manifestation which is believed to occur mainly in country areas and to attach itself to a particular place. It is often malevolent and terrifying and it is unpredictable. Why did this elemental inhabit Lep? Could it have been the combined horrors of the bloody O'Carroll murder? And all those lost, dead souls walled up in the oubliette, drifting in despair to death? Whatever it may have been, after Mrs. Darby's experiments with the black arts, the castle was never the same again. Hauntings plagued Lep, leaving a sinister air throughout the castle. 
The Derby stubbornly remained at Lepp, but in 1922 the castle suffered another misfortune when, as the home of an English family, it became the target of the Irish struggle for independence. The castle was destroyed by bombs and completely looted. Nothing but a burned-out shell remained. The Derbys were driven out. Eventually, in the 1970s, Lepp was bought by an Australian who had links with the area. At this time, a mystic, a white witch from Mexico, was brought in to exorcise the castle. After spending many hours in the bloody chapel, the mystic explained that the spirits at Lepp were no longer malevolent, but they wished to remain there. Six years ago, Sean Ryan and his wife Anne bought the castle. A complete ruin. When they arrived, the family is making it habitable again. In the meantime, they live in the castle gatehouse with their young daughter. When Sean and Anne Ryan bought Lepp, they knew they were taking on a castle with a troubled history. You and Sean have been here for five years now. Five years, yeah. Turning a pretty grim ruin into a home. Mm -hmm. Tell me, have you had any supernatural experiences? Well, shortly after we arrived here, Sean began working on the building. He had an unfortunate accident and he broke his kneecap, which actually had to be removed and it set us back about a year with the work. When the kneecap repaired, he started to work again. And he had another accident and broke his ankle. And we began to think that we weren't really wanted here, there was something going on. But um, we've overcome that now and we're back restoring the building again. So we're, we're happy to share the place with whatever it's spirits it. are here. In 1991, Lepp's walls echoed to an unfamiliar sound, laughter. Friends and family gathered in the chapel to witness the christening of Sean and Anne's young daughter, Kira. Strewn with flowers and lit by candles, the chapel was filled with smiling faces. We had a marvellous day, all our friends in great atmosphere, so we think we've laid to rest anything that might have happened previously. After the ceremony, every guest noted how even though there was a strong wind blowing in from the fields through the open windows, the candles barely flickered and not one blew out. If Lepp's troubled spirits are unwilling to leave, let us hope that at least they have found peace. In this land where so much is attributed to myth and legend, the castle ghosts we have encountered remind us that not all mysterious events belong in storybooks. For the people who come face to face with ghosts, the images are a real and often shocking reminder of a world beyond our own.
In Ireland's castles, it is as if spirits from thousands of years ago reach out to touch us. The sorcery of an ancient people casts a spell over the living. Spontaneous manifestations assault the senses with their intensity. The anguish of violent death leaves a grim influence. Can the tormented spirits of the past ever be laid to rest? In mystical Ireland, where the fairies can weave a web to catch mortals, who can say for sure? If you think you're the sort of person who'll never see a ghost, think again. Ghosts have a habit of springing surprises. And the next person to see one could be you.